Good morning. It's 8 a.m. here in Singapore, midnight in London and 2 a.m. in Zimbabwe, where Robert Mugabe took the country and the world by surprise this afternoon when he suddenly resigned after almost four decades in power. Without warning, his letter of resignation was read out in Parliament just as impeachment proceedings against him were getting underway. The news sparked wild celebrations with thousands of people pouring onto the streets in the capital, Harare. Our capital, our Africa editor, Fergal King, was in Parliament when the news broke. Well, after nearly four decades in power, Robert Mugabe is the only leader many Zimbabweans have ever known. Our Zimbabwe correspondent, Shingai Nyoka, has been talking to some of the people celebrating in the capital, Harare. Recent visit to Beijing by Zimbabwe's military chief has fueled suspicions that China may have given the green light to the change in leadership. Earlier, Robert Kuhn, the author of How China's Leaders Think, told me Beijing said that the timing of this visit was a coincidence. Let's just catch up with some of the days of the news for you now. The U.S. has announced it's imposing new sanctions on North Korea. Well, you're watching Newsday on the BBC, still to come on the programme. Welcome back. You're watching Newsday on the BBC. I'm Sharon Jutlayam in Singapore. Thanks for joining us. I'm Babita Sharma in London. Our top stories. Let's stay with that, our top story. Robert Mugabe has uh, been Zimbabwe's only leader since independence in 1980. His part in achieving that won him the status of a hero in the anti-colonial struggle. But then during his long years in power, he presided over decades of political repression and economic chaos. Here's our Africa correspondent, Andrew Harding. Now, the U.S. has announced that it's imposing new sanctions on North Korea. The U.S. Treasury said the measures are designed to stop the funding of the country's nuclear and ballistic missiles program. They will target North Korean shipping operations and several Chinese firms that trade with Pyongyang. Our North America correspondent, Peter Bowes, has more. Peter Bowes speaking to me earlier. Now, school holidays are just around the corner, and many students might be thinking about taking a working vacation to Australia. But beware. A report shows such visitors are routinely ripped off. The wage theft in Australia report conducted by three universities in Sydney surveyed more than 4,300 overseas workers. It found a third of backpackers and a quarter of international students in Australia are being paid nine US dollars an hour or less. That's about half the minimum wage. Conditions are worst for those employed in food services and on farms and for workers from Asian countries. Well, Laurie Berg is a senior lecturer of, the, of law at University of Technology, Sydney, and was one of the authors of this report. She joins us now from uh, Sydney. Now, uh, tell us first, Professor Berg, why are so many workers allowing themselves to be exploited this way? Because it's the sort of thing you'd expect from developing countries, not a first world one uh, like Australia. That's it for this edition of Newsday. We're ending the programme with some of the sights and sounds from a historic day in Zimbabwe. Welcome to Newsday. I'm Sharon Jutlail in Singapore. The headline. I'm Babita Sharma in London, also in the programme. Well, good morning. It's 9 a.m. here in Singapore, 1 a.m. in London and 3 a.m. in Zimbabwe, where Robert Mugabe took the country and the world by surprise when he suddenly resigned after almost four decades in power. Without warning, his letter of resignation was read out in Parliament just as impeachment proceedings against him were getting underway. The news sparked wild celebrations with thousands of people pouring onto the streets in the capital, Harare. Our Africa editor, Fergal King, was in Parliament when the news broke. Well, after nearly four decades in power, Robert Mugabe is the only leader many Zimbabweans have ever known. Our Zimbabwe correspondent, Shenga Nyoka, has been uh, talking to some of the people celebrating in the capital, Harare. Well, a recent visit to Beijing by Zimbabwe's military chief has fueled suspicions that China may have given the green light to the change in leadership. Earlier, Robert Kuhn, the author of How China's Leaders Think, told me Beijing said that the timing of that visit was a coincidence. Robert Kuhn there speaking to me a little earlier. Let's just catch up with some of the days of the news for you now. And the US has announced it's imposing new sanctions on North Korea. US Welcome back. You're watching Newsday on the BBC. I'm Sharon Jitlail in Singapore. Yes, thanks for joining us. I'm Babita Sharma in London. Our top stories. Well, let's get more now on our top story. Robert Mugabe has been Zimbabwe's only leader since independence in 1980. His part in achieving that won him the status of a hero in the anti-colonial struggle. But then, during his long years in power, he presided over decades of political repression and economic chaos. Here's our Africa correspondent, Andrew Harding. 
Now, teams from around the world are continuing their search for an Argentine submarine that's been missing for nearly a week. The San Juan last made contact off the Argentine coast six days ago with 44 crew on board. The search effort has been made difficult by strong winds and rough seas, but conditions are improving. Well, Robert Farley is a senior lecturer at the University of Kentucky and has written on the subject. He joins me now live. Uh, welcome to the programme, Professor Farley. Now, first off, we know that this uh, search is particularly challenging because submarines by nature are, are rather hard to find. Can you tell us why? That's it for this edition of Newsday. We're ending the programme with some of the sights and sounds from a historic day in Zimbabwe. I'm Kasia Madeira in London, also in this programme. Now we have some breaking news for you from Papua New Guinea because we have reports that an operation is underway at the Manus Island Detention Centre in Papua New Guinea. Now this operation is to evict hundreds of refugees and asylum seekers. Detainees fear that reprisals from local people uh, will take place if they are transferred from this facility to other facilities. Let's cross over to Sydney, Hal Griffith is there for us. How you've been covering this for us for quite some time. Bring us up to speed on what this operation is exactly about. That operation taking place at the Manus Island Detention Center. But now let's take a look at what else is making the news today. For the first time, the US Secretary of State has described the violence against the Rohingya Muslim minority in Myanmar's Rakhine state as ethnic cleansing. Now, Rex Tillerson said that those responsible for these atrocities must be held accountable. More than 600,000 Rohingya have fled to neighboring Bangladesh since the violence erupted in Rakhine State late in August. Well, earlier I asked our Washington correspondent, Laura Bicker, about the consequences of the U.S. using the term ethnic cleansing. Now, in the U.S., highways and airports are already getting busy as a record number of people are expected to travel for this year's Thanksgiving celebrations. More than 51 million Americans are expected to venture away from home. This is the largest number for more than a decade. And forecasters say that this is a sign that the economy is improving. And staying with the seasonal theme, this lady in the middle is Lily Rose Depp, and she has... Now, in a mesmerizing video, for the past 20 years, NASA satellites have been recording life on Earth. Now, that data has been compiled into a real stunning, mesmerizing time-lapse video that scientists also say provides a new perspective on climate change and also the hunt for alien life. Paul Blake reports from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. Well, back down on Earth, here's a much-anticipated Ashes first test update. It is underway. Now, let's update you on some developments from Papua New Guinea because an operation is underway at the Manus Island Detention Centre in Papua New Guinea. It's to evict the hundreds of refugees and asylum seekers who are still there. Detainees fear reprisals from local people if they are transferred to other facilities. Let's cross over live to Sydney. Hal Griffiths is there for us. So, Hal, just bring us up to date on this operation. Difficult situation, Hal. Thank you very much for bringing us up to date on that operation taking place right now. Hal Griffiths there in Sydney. Well, let's bring you up to date with other stories making the news. A court in Pakistan has ordered the release of the Islamist leader who was suspected of mastermind. Highways and airports are all getting ready in the United States for a busy period as a record number of people are expected to travel during the holiday period, the Thanksgiving celebrations. More than 51 million Americans are expected to venture away from home. This is the largest number for more than a decade. And forecasters are saying that this is a sign that the economy is improving. And staying with the seasonal theme, this lady in the middle is Lily Rose Depp, and she is just switching on, there you go, the Christmas lights on the Champs-Élysées in Paris. She is the 18-year-old daughter of the Hollywood superstar Johnny Depp and one of France's biggest musical stars, Vanessa Paradis. And she's doing it in Paris because she has actually lived in France for most of her life. Michael Rusker there speaking to Rico a little earlier on those incredible images about that defection from North Korea. Now, for the first time, the U.S. Secretary of State has described the violence against the Rohingya Muslim minority in Myanmar's Rakhine state as ethnic cleansing. Rex Tillerson said that those responsible for these atrocities must also be held accountable. More than 600,000 Rohingya have fled to neighboring Bangladesh since violence erupted in Rakhine state late in August. Our Washington correspondent, Laura Bicker, told me about the consequences of the U U.S. using this term, ethnic cleansing. 
I'm Kesha Madeira in London, also in this programme. Well, for the very latest on the missing submarine, I spoke to Veronica Smink from BBC Mundo, who is in Buenos Aires. Mink from Buenos Aires. We'll, of course, continue to monitor that story. But now let's take a look at some of the day's other news because a new era is set to begin in Zimbabwe with this man, Emerson Mnangagwa, due to be sworn in as the next president. Now, he has warned people not to engage in acts of revenge on supporters of Robert Mugabe and his wife, Grace. In a statement, he said that the country is witnessing a new and unfolding democracy. Well, my colleague Ben Brown is in the capital, Harare, and he told us what we can expect from the new leader. Now, if you have heard of the film Snakes on a Plane, well, have a look at this. It could be the sequel, Snakes on a Train. Yes, see what we did there? Now, some unlucky passengers were caught on a train and they came face to face with this stowaway. Luckily, they had a very brave person who took it upon himself to whack the, this snake on the train in Jakarta and managed to safely, I'm glad to say, remove it. So, snakes on a train. Lots more on that story on our website. But now, if you are waking up, if it's morning time where you are and you'd like some more coffee, well, here's some advice. Go right ahead, because it turns out that coffee may actually be good for you, as Helen Briggs explains. Now, it's known as one of the most closed and secretive societies in the world, but each year, hundreds of people defect from North Korea. They're often a source of fascination, but some of the questions that they're asked can be a bit daft. The BBC gathered three North Korean defectors together to tell us about some of the strangest questions that they've been asked. BBC Mundo's Veronica Smink there speaking to me from Buenos Aires. Of course, we're continuing to monitor that. We've also got a special page dedicated on our website. But now let's take a look at another big story today because a new era is set to begin in Zimbabwe with this man, Emerson Mnangagwa, due to be sworn in as the next president a little later on today. He's warned people not to take part in acts of revenge on the supporters of Robert Mugabe and also his wife, Grace. In a statement, he said that the country is witnessing a new and unfolding democracy. Well, my colleague Ben Brown is in the capital, Harare, and he told us what we can expect from this new leader. Ben Brown in Harare, and of course, we'll have a special, co special coverage of that inauguration a little later on on Friday. Now, in other news, one of Pakistan's most high-profile Islamist leaders, Hafiz Saeed, has been released from house. Now, you've heard of Snakes on a Plane, the film. This could be the sequel. This is a snake on a train. And as you can see, some unlucky passengers were faced with this unexpected stowaway aboard a commuter train in Jakarta. But quite incredibly, a brave passenger, there you go, managed to get the snake down, whacked it on its head, and then threw it out of the train uh, very successfully after... I'm assuming, killing the snake. Perhaps a Hollywood career in the making? Who knows? Yes, lots more on that on our website. Now, if you are just waking up or working through the night, for that matter, and need coffee, well, the advice is go for it. It turns out that coffee may actually be good for you. Three or four cups a day could even lower the risk of liver disease, heart problems and cancer. That's according to new research which has been published in the British Medical Journal, as Helen Briggs explains. Sam Elton Walters there speaking to Rico a little earlier. Now, it's known as one of the most closed and secretive societies in the world, but each year hundreds of people defect from North Korea. They're often a source of fascination, but some of the questions that they're asked can be, well, a bit daft, quite frankly. The BBC gathered three North Korean defectors together to tell us about some of the strangest questions they've had to answer. Welcome to Newsday on the BBC. I'm Sharon Jute Lail in Singapore, the headlines. I'm Kesha Madeira in London, also in this programme, the first... Well, good morning. It's 8 a.m. here in Singapore, midnight in London, and 8 a.m. in Bali in Indonesia, where authorities have raised the threat of a volcanic eruption to the highest level, and that means it could happen in the next 24 hours. And we will be looking and speaking to a geologist who's just come back from Bali, so we'll get his predictions and his readings into what is taking place and when uh, Mount Agung will finally erupt. First of all, though, let's bring you up to date with some of the day's other news stories because the first aid ship has arrived at the Yemeni port of Salif there after the Saudi-led coalition eased a blockade that lasted for nearly three weeks. Now, millions of people in Yemen are at risk of starvation while a civil war is being fought between the government 
uh, backed by the Saudi-led coalition and Houthi rebels. Stephen Anderson is the director of the World Food Programme in Yemen. And speaking from the capital, Sana, he confirmed that their ship was waiting to unload. That was Stephen Anderson, the director of the World Food Programme in Yemen, speaking to us from Sana. Also making news today, at least 23 civilians are reported killed in the latest Syrian government attacks on them. Now, this is a British teenage gamer who has become Formula One's first eSports champion. This is Brendan Lee, who's an 18-year-old kitchen manager. He came out on the top of the 20 simulator drivers competing in this very tense final in Dubai. More than 63,000 hopefuls from all over the world entered this competition in September, but Brendan wins the right to be a non-driver character in the official F1 2018 game. Watch out for him. Pope Francis will visit Myanmar today amid international concern over the country's treatment of its Rohingya Muslim population. It's the first ever papal visit to the country where Catholics number around 700,000, making up around 1% of the population. Now, the visit uh, takes place as the Rohingya crisis continues. He is under international pressure to raise the military crackdown on the Rohingya Muslims in his meeting with de facto leader Aung San Suu Kyi. Now, more than uh, 600,000 Rohingyas have fled across the border to neighboring Bangladesh. This may be the most delicate diplomatic task in his four years as leader of the Catholic Church. Well, earlier I asked Aaron Connolly from the Lowy Institute for International Policy about how he could manage this challenge. We're going to return to Bali because Mount Agung is, we are being told, about to erupt. It could erupt within the next... Hello, I'm Kesha Madeira with BBC World News. Our top story, Indonesia's Disaster Management Agency has raised the threat of an eruption in Bali to the highest level. This means that it could happen in the next 24 hours. Thousands of people have been evacuated. Now it's time for our world. Over recent months, hundreds of thousands of Rohingya Muslims have fled from Myanmar to Bangladesh, driven from their homes facing terrible violence. Gabriel Gatehouse tells the story of one massacre in the village of Tula Toli. And I have to tell you that this program contains distressing and graphic accounts and images of violence from the very beginning.